denominator of selection. Like it's literally the bottom and stuff. Okay. All assuming everything else is equal, that's where uh, you should see this population come up. And if we could come up with a way to test it, it would be really nice. Um, the problem, um, oh, I just put the numbers here for you guys, um, right? Um, this just gives you a fill, if you just like try to put it into context. It is actually a significant amount of energy over the time the, uh, the, on the planet, right? So that, that does make sense. And of course, we're actually getting more of those events per replication event than just one, right? It's not the same as cells. We're actually up in order of magnitude, maybe. Okay. So all of these are very conservative guesstimations of this, okay? The important thing is, is don't think of this as happening in a population, uh, sorry, globally, right? This only happens very locally, right? So this is only this, this virus, okay? There's like, let's say, let's say there's, you know, millions of infections happening every second out there for that particular virus, okay? But locally, those populations are still competing against each other, right? So you have to remember, it wasn't like the virus that is on in the Pacific is competing with the one in the Atlantic in any, in any real um, uh, version of the world. It's just that over time, as you move through, you would expect to see this guy do statistically better. Good? They've got that? Right? So this doesn't require recombination. It doesn't require anything else. This is just energetic selection based on information. All right. So what you end up with is this, this hypothesis that the land hours limit, so this ability to uh, uh, look at information um, is going to be the smallest force of selection. So this puts an absolute limit on it. So it's going to be about 10 to the minus 21 joules that we're looking at. That's way, way below anything that we can do in the lab. Right? So in the lab, you can take a population of cells and you can work with, like, what? If you could get 10 to the 15, that would be a lot, right? Okay? So this is way below that, just so you know. Okay? So then, the reason that we can see it in the viruses, at least I'm arguing, is because, one, it's more enhanced in them, because they're only information. They don't have all this other crap going on as they move from generation to generation. Just like you might see a, mut uh, you know, a mutation in a book easier, right, than all of the paper and stuff associated with it. Okay. Right, this, and we only, uh, the reason we haven't done the lab experiment is because it's really hard to do this. <laughs> that would take a long time. Okay. So effectively, we have to use something as big as the Earth, or so far we've had to use something as big as the Earth uh, to have any hints that this is going on. All right, so then you come to the other part of it, which would be, what about why do we have all this diversity then, right? So if this thing is happening and energetic we should need to uh, start to address that part of the question. Are you guys relatively clear on what I said here? Even though I know it's very confusing, but you have to. I have a question. <coughs> yeah. So if this is obviously, we can't really measure this in a machine or in a lab because it's just not feasible. So yeah. you can yeah. use the different temperatures throughout basically geological time to figure it out. No, it would be too subtle. Yeah. Too subtle? Too subtle. But there's actually, remember, these are not, you know, so in like the, uh, in CERN, right, the collider system, right, they're actually using calorimeters that are working not quite this low, but in the same regions, right? So there are possibilities that you might be able to come up with a way, a, 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 an empirical way to actually look at this directly. We, we know, in fact, I can show you, and I'll show you uh, at least some of the references of places where people actually have done some of this. Okay. Um, all right, so this is viral information, okay? And this is basically this link between what we're seeing genetically and this physical information. So what, what I'm gonna argue, at least for this part of it, is that genetic information is just the instruction set that sets up all of those Maxwell demons. All right, 
And what they're doing is they're converting physical information, so the universe, into themselves. And we'll go back to this in just a second. But, and that the viral part uh, becomes from these basic things, right? It's that this information is basically invasive, right? So a virus goes in and it invades a cell and it turns that cell into itself. It's xenotrophic, which means that it's uh, not, uh, so the virus is not the same as the cell. And I'm going to even show you that it reduces thermodynamic efficiency. I'll show you why I think that is true. Okay. So these are examples of where people have actually looked directly at physical information. And um, I'm not going to go through them in detail. This is probably the easiest one to see. So the logic here is that you have something that is a step, right, where you're just grabbing that particle, right? And every time that particle, uh, uh, if the demon notices that the particle is up one step, so this is, remember, it's going up that energy of activation, it puts a barrier, okay? And then it has no choice, it's gonna bounce around and then it'll end up here and you can put another barrier. And you can walk it up a step, and then that's how you end up with basically heat differential. So you can drop it, right, and do work down here, and do it again. That would be a potential motion machine. So if you do this, you can actually use information to do work, okay? The problem is, is it takes a massive scaffold to do it. And by that, I mean, in this case, the way it was done was actually this massive computer that was measuring where the particles were. So you need something that do, does that. That's what I'm proposing life is doing. So it's setting up the, the scaffolding that allows it to do big games like that. So it can actually then use information, so the relative positions of things in the universe, to do work. All right, so again, we'll just go back to this. It's easy to imagine that this is an enzyme, right? Because that's exactly what enzymes do, right? They just pick out hot things and they put them in something else, okay? And in fact, you trap them in complexes. This is almost a perpetual uh, uh, motion machine. This is what uh, Peter calls a perpetual motion machine of the third kind. Because of course, you can bounce around here for a long time, right, until you capture something. And what you'll end up with is a complex that can't just go backwards, right? So uh, the one that they use is uh, the lambda uh, end system. Okay. All right, the <coughs> other thing is, is that you can actually measure this um, uh, you could measure the destruction of information using calorimetry. And I'm going to keep using information, but information is just the other side of entropy. Right? So this is, this is basically a loss of order of information or a loss of information. Okay? I actually think, I'm starting to believe that this stuff is actually that this was really useful when we're building steam engines, but it's not really what we're trying to talk about. What we're talking about are how things are ordered in the universe, which I think information is a better term. All right, and the types of calorimetries that you need to remember. There's isothermal ones, right? So that's where you just measure, you keep everything at the same temperature and you measure heat coming out of it, right, as you do work. So heat going out or heat coming in. And then bomb calorimetry is when you take something and you blow it and you, uh, so you have it literally like a little vial and you combust it down to its elements and you imagine, and you measure the amount of heat that comes out of that, okay? So that's telling you about the information that is lost. Okay? And so this tells you a rate and this is, tells you uh, the amount of stuff that's actually contained within uh, a fraction. All right, so how does this probably look? Okay. And so what I'm gonna argue that we can actually measure it. Okay. So this is um, basically a graph where you have genetic information going along here. And for our purposes, this is actually metagenomes. This could be one genome going along here. And you could have a lot of, you have a lot of E. coli and, they, they, and they, uh, this axis gets longer. Or you can have a mixture of, of different species going along that axis, right? You just have a big line of genetic information. Good, everybody know that idea some. That's why 
Floron stuff works. That's why the, uh, uh, you can do the facts assemblies and get an idea of diversity and so forth. In case you remember that, we talked about that before, remember? Okay. Along this line, we've got physical information, which is what we can measure with, uh, with calorimetry. Okay. And right here is the line of unity. And what this would say is that every species, every unit of species, costs you a certain amount here. Right? Make sense? Okay. This would be completely consistent with these ecological principles like niche exclusion or niche partitioning. You guys have heard of these? What's niche partitioning or niche exclusion? Anyone? Exclusion is like a physical barrier. Yeah, so niche exclusion is like you have a certain amount of resources, right? And you go in, and you can imagine there's, a, again, a line of resources, let's say. And what happens is that if you're the first one in there, you grab a certain amount of those resources, okay? And so you've excluded that part of the ecosystem from everything else, okay? And then you get to break that 